Hello everybody. For today's video I am going to talk to you about our book Between the World and Me by ta Coates. And as I talk to you this is going to be more like a podcast than a video because uh, many of us learn well from listening and if you're an auditory learner then this should help you think about and move forward in your understanding of the book. So, um, I will begin by showing you where to find a sample of the book. Now, I understand that for various reasons you might not have your copy of the book on the first day or second day or sometimes even the third day of class. Or you might just be at the beach if you're really lucky and holy cow, you forgot your book, but you don't want to fall behind. So in our June 1st folder, I have a sample that's published online of an excerpt from Between the World and Me. Now this is nice because it has a picture of Coates with Samari when Samari was a baby. Super cute. This was published last year when the book first came out. Or actually, yeah, I think it was published when the book first came out. So that is the face you can put to the voice that you're reading. If you're listening on audible.com, which is more than fine with me, I do it all the time. I listen to books as audiobooks on my iPhone with headphones. When I'm washing dishes, walking my children in their stroller, walking the dogs, all kinds of stuff, because I'm a busy person too, and I love listening to books. The book is read by the author, Mr. Coates himself, who you see right there, and it's a great companion to have the audiobook with the printed text. However, as I was saying, this is an excerpt from the Coates book that was published online and is freely accessible that I have placed here for your convenience should you need it. Please also find an audio or visual copy of the book because there are many wonderful things in the book that don't appear in this much shorter online version. Go to the local library. They should have plenty of copies of it. If not, make them order it or interlibrary loan it or buy it. It's a good thing to have. Um, we have an epigraph by James Baldwin, one of the great American novelists and artist activists of the 20th century. One of his most famous books is called Go Tell It on the Mountain. Highly recommend that and anything by James Baldwin, also a magnificent essayist. But I won't, um, I won't carry on about James Baldwin for now. We begin with Baldwin's Epigraph. An epigraph is just some writing that you put at the beginning of a text by another author to set the tone. So in this epigraph, we have from James Baldwin and have brought humanity to the edge of oblivion because they think they are white. That sets the tone for Coates's work. Now, one of the reasons that Coates is such a great text for introduction to African American studies is because he uses an African-American studies perspective to write this letter to his son about how to live as a black man, a black person in the United States of America in 2015, 16, 17. He won the National Book Award. The, book audi the book's audience is first and foremost because it is called an epistolary book or a book which is a letter, epistolary meaning letter, to his son, is this little baby who has now grown up to be a teenager, Samari Coates. But the book's audience is obviously, you know, everybody in the world because authors want their books to sell well. Coates won the National Book Award. He's been featured on many public radio shows. He's one of the best-known black writers of our current historical moment. But he also draws from history, and part of his African-American studies method is that 
He uses James Baldwin. He uses Richard Wright. He uses Zora Neale Hurston. He references history in order to place us in the moment we are right now. So African American studies always connects past to present. It's like African spirituality is always connected to the ancestors. If you might know anything about African spirituality, well, African American studies likewise connected to the ancestors, those who made the road for us. So <clears throat> we have our Baldwin questioning the idea of whiteness. We have African American studies. We know there's such a thing as African American culture. But then we throw out this question, is there really such a thing as whiteness? When you think about it, it's a crazy idea, and I think it's kind of a dangerous idea. Nonetheless, it's something we need to deal with. So this goes to our course syllabus objectives, that if they look overwhelming to you, please don't be discouraged. Let me, I'm sorry, I thought I had the syllabus open, give me a second. But our course syllabus objectives talk about how African Americans have negotiated white culture, predominant dominant culture, predominantly white culture, in order to strive for equality, have interpreted dominant cultural signs. What I mean by that is we have this concept of white. And there's an implicit understanding amongst probably the majority of white Americans that whiteness means something and has a particular value, and that people who are white are the real Americans. I don't think any of this is true, but I think there's lots of symbols and signs and cultural messages that reinforce that idea. The Black Lives Matter movement, on the other hand, challenges that idea of the implicit value of whiteness, the idea of whiteness, and asks us to think about the meaning, the value, the importance of blackness. But what I'm trying to tell you here is that these are dominant cultural signs. They're not something you can put under a microscope and study. They're not scientific. God did not make a black race and a white race. God made the human race, if you believe in God. Scientists would agree we're a human race. The real scientific difference between African Americans and Anglo Americans, who might be English descent, who knows? That's part of the craziness of the idea of white, is so many different people count, technically, in this Caucasian or white idea. But anyway, that aside, um, the the question is about much more than white. So just take take from what I'm saying here um, my, my point that race is not a natural, real, scientific, hard evidence kind of thing. Race is a set of assumptions and meanings and beliefs that have developed and been created through history. They still, it still has a real impact, but it's not necessarily something that cannot change. So the dominant cultural signs are the meanings people attribute to race. So this idea of whiteness, people thinking they're white, it's a sign, a dominant cultural sign is taken for granted, but it's not necessarily true or right or just or fair. So back to the Coates text. I'm just trying to link the syllabus objectives a little bit here to what Coates actually says between, in Between the World and Me. And what I was linking there specifically was this quote, because they think they are white. Coates is going to keep saying that to us. They think they are white. People who think they are white. The dreamers. People who live in this American dream. A dream of equality and fairness and colorblindness. Well, Good luck being colorblind, Coates would probably say, if you're Tamir Rice. Whereas for white people, it's easy usually to claim to be colorblind because they don't get singled out for the color of their skin. They're not in danger for the color of their skin. And that critical difference is also part of African American studies perspective. So my first point that I'm trying to make here is that race is an idea. It's not a thing. 
this book questions the assumption that race and racism are natural or inevitable or that the world has to be that way or that it's human nature. If you asked the typical white American who doesn't know very many people different from him, what causes racism? That person might just say, well, people are different. And he might assume that people really are naturally different. He might not have questioned it a great deal. Coates tells us that racism is actually something totally unlike a natural occurrence that happens because people are different. Coates says that Americans believe in the reality of the rate of race as an indubitable feature of their natural world. People are some people are black, some people are white. We're different, therefore we might not get along. Well, Coates doesn't buy that explanation. Coates tells us a rather different story. He tells us that the idea of race was invented to justify exploitation. The most outstanding example in U.S. history being slavery. How do you justify enslaving millions of people, stealing them from their home, dragging them across the Atlantic in an ocean, in a ship, and selling them? Well, that's where the story of black and white began. Prior to that, human beings didn't categorize themselves by race. Everybody was human. But with slavery came this idea of race, which is why Coates tells us that race is the child of racism, not the father. Racism came first, the desire to exploit, the desire to be superior over someone, the desire to take advantage of someone, the desire to create an unequal playing field. That's racism. That came before this idea of race. And then all of the dominant cultural signs that got attributed to black people were created to justify slavery, later to justify lynching, to justify segregation, and today, one could argue, to justify police brutality. We'll talk about that more as the semester continues. Now, there's also a document handout to go with what I'm saying that you can read that might help you process some of these ideas that I'm proposing. But we also have this audio version with me talking um, in, in the case that you're a person who might learn from something like a podcast or from listening to someone talk. Race is the child of racism, not the father. <clears throat> now think about it. You might say, well, race is obviously a, a real natural thing because we do have different skin colors and we do have different hair textures. But think about the different gradations of skin color and the huge variety of hair colors. Think about how much attention we pay to those things. Whereas, do you pay close attention to how big somebody's ears are or how big their feet are or whether their teeth are pointy? What if race was built on the whole, what if the idea wasn't to steal people from Africa, but rather to, uh, to steal people who had big hands and enslave them. You know, that could have been what happened in human history. Then race would be the big hands versus the little hands. Talk to Ted Cruz and Donald Trump about that one. We notice skin color and hair texture because racism has emphasized it. It's not really as big a deal as we think it is. So, there is this idea of whiteness. It's the assumption that we live in a fair and colorblind land built on equal opportunity. It's the dream that Coates talks about. But he wants us to know, he wants his son to know, he reminds all of us that it's not natural. It's not natural that more white people have more money or are in Congress or have more power and more influence. It's because they've been able to take advantage of others and use race as an excuse. That's kind of an oversimplification, but that's kind of this different paradigm, this shift in understanding of what race means that African-American studies asks us to think about. 
Coates says on page six, the progress of those Americans who believe that they are white comes from systematic exploitation. This country became a wealthy country and people got to be white, powerful, first world Americans because of slavery. Money from slavery, blood money. That history also limited the choices that people of African descent had in life. First, forced to work for free in slavery, then for less money, pretty much since then, and sometimes in illegal capacities. He tells his son on page 12 that this question of how one should live within a black body is the question of his life. So he's not saying that it's not important that he has black skin and curly hair, although it looks pretty short to me. Um, it is important, it is significant, because it's the sign that has controlled his life, but it's not all of him. It doesn't tell the full story. Something else he's asking us to think about. And I'll say finally, coming from a perspective of white America, that most white people simply don't understand how dangerous it is to be black in America. No matter who you are or how careful you are, you can be mistaken for a dangerous criminal and shot or beaten or harassed. And that's part of something that white people just can't really fathom. Like, what is it most white people? What would it be like to have the color of your skin put your life in jeopardy through no fault of your own. There's a great Netflix series, or a really good Netflix series, called Dear White People. It's about some really privileged African-American and a few African students at a fictional Ivy League university. They're privileged. They're mostly from very elite backgrounds. They're the, you know, the 1% of black culture in the United States. But they still face some of the dangers. And I won't, spoiler alert, you know, I won't go much further. They still face these dangers that Coates is talking about, which are knowing how to live in a black body. So I don't want to talk too much. And, um, you, you know, if you want to use this to help you fall asleep, that's fine. But that's not my <laughs> prime purpose here. I'm trying to help understand and get you to think about and talk about the material on the discussion board eventually. But think about the title. Coates' audience for this book, a lot of white people read this book. This book sold many copies. I could check on Amazon and try to see how many copies it sold, but let me, trust me, a lot of white people, well-meaning, good-intentioned white people who want to do the right thing, read this book and paid for it and listened to it on Audible. So I think that's interesting because his title is much more inflammatory, dangerous, uh, controversy-causing than it seems at its surface. His title comes from a poem by Richard Wright. We mentioned James Baldwin at the beginning of this lecture. Richard Wright is another great American novelist. And if you haven't heard of Richard Wright or James Baldwin, search their names in Films on Demand. Google them. Find out who they are. They're really important to American culture. But this poem by Richard Wright is also... Sorry. Forgive me for being slow in opening the poem. I just intended to show you that it's right there on Blackboard, but now I'm not used to using Chrome and I can't get it to open. Okay. This poem by Richard Wright, Between, Between the World and Me, read carefully, is about a horrific event. It's about a lynching. If you don't know, about the history of lynching in the United States. Again, Google it. Look at Wikipedia. So, really, 
um, the title of the book itself, because it invokes to those who have read the poem, who know Richard Wright, who understand its context, is about some of the most brutal and unjust perversions of the law in lynching that are part of U.S. history. Yet it's still kind of subtle. You have to actually go look up the poem to fully understand that Coates is referencing something so powerful. The actual epigraph to the book in which, oh no, let's see, does he have a line? I'm flipping through my actual pages of the book here. He has a few lines from the poem at the beginning of the book, and I'll read to you what he actually reproduces. And one morning, while in the woods, I stumbled suddenly upon the thing, stumbled upon it in a grassy clearing guarded by scaly oaks and elms. And the sooty details of the scene rose, thrusting themselves between the world and me. Now, it's not obvious from that that it is a dead body he's looking at, that it's a murdered African-American person whose humanity has been stripped and denied and violently torn apart by a lynch mob. Not obvious, but it's a message that Coates is sending for those who really want to understand further. Now finally, and again, you can look at the handout, um, the, the visual handout with the kind of printed out version of these notes. It's not verbatim. I don't, I don't read anything word to word from you, uh, but I'd like to offer different ways of explaining things. But if you look at the printout on Blackboard, which includes a transcript, not verbatim, not word for word, but these notes on coats here, I have a big takeaway. <clears throat> I've just talked about lynching. I've talked about violence. I've talked about this toxic idea of whiteness. Well, that's not what this class is about. I've dedicated my life's work to African American studies. I'm an internationally recognized expert in certain topics having to do with African American studies. And there, it's not about lynching. It's not about suffering. It's not about how black people have been mistreated. That's part of the story. The reason that Coates wrote this book, the reason that I study African American studies, is because we can find the very best versions of what it means to be American from African American examples. So when Coates references Baldwin, Wright, possibly Nat Turner, all of the people he's going to mention and all of the figures that he talks about in this book, who we will explore further this semester, really tell us what justice and equality are supposed to look like. African American studies is crucial to everybody in this United States if we're going to move forward as a fair and just and equal nation. So that's the big takeaway. Between the World and Me is a, a sad book in some ways, and a lot of people read it as being bitter or downcast. But I think the ways that it emphasizes the positive are incredibly powerful too. So try to think about those powerful, positive examples. Mm -hmm. Try to think of the strength from the ancestors that Coates invokes as he tells us these stories. And that's what African American studies is really about. So until next time, keep learning. Have a great day.